Welcome to Talking About Singing, where we talk about singing. This is a podcast where we discuss and review albums, say what we like, what we didn't like, and just generally nitpick. This week, I'm not even going to introduce my co-hosts. They are so far below our very special guest, David C. Doc Snyder. Uh, welcome to the show, David. How's it going? Not too bad. How are you guys doing today? Good. Really doing great. Doing great. Dylan, how are so you? So far below, that's... That's high praise. <laughs> well, yeah, these these slightly, these slightly unnecessary high praise. No, you got to put these guys in their place. They're really real uppity if you don't just <laughs> give it to them now and then. No, I'm excited. We've never had we've never interviewed anybody on here before. So, I, oh, I'm the first. Yeah, yeah. Wow, I am honored. Th- yes, as you should be. I'm the highly. I don't know. I don't know, anticipated first thing uh, talking about singing. Yeah, 2019, kicking it off strong. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, yeah, first, for people that don't your, know your name right off the top of their head, can you give us kind of a, a synopsis, what you're doing now? We know we know you from producing Chuck D's last couple albums. Uh, what's your, uh, your cliff notes of your resume there? Uh, yeah, that's kind of my uh, current claim to fame um i've been working with chuck and public enemy oh geez um for about um see now i gotta do math it's 2019 so um you know it's it's been 14 years i guess i've been working with them wow Uh, Wow. i mean i was official well officially longer than that i've known chuck for uh about 20 years now so um I, i came in right at the the end of their uh the Def Jam era when they went independent and um Chuck was very active on the internet and uh had a <clears throat> excuse me had a a fan site uh, publicenemy.com and had a uh, message board on there if you guys remember message boards mm-hmm. um and uh and so I you know I reached out and and became part of a public enemy <laughs> fan community and I started sending him remixes of stuff I was doing And, um, he was setting up a a digital label at the time called slam jams. And that was, that was the kind of the start of our collaboration. And then, uh, he, he knew that I did, uh, film and video stuff, which was actually what I kind of grew up doing. Uh, music was just kind of a, a, a fun thing to do. I went to film school for a while. Um, and then, and then ran out of money and dropped out, but I was always making, you know, short films and things like that. And, uh, around 2005, he finally said, Hey, you know what? I'm going to make you the guy to, to do our music videos now. And so since 2005, I've done almost all of the public enemy and, and his solo music videos. So that's, that's it. in in a nutshell. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. So you started off not even producing, you were just the, the cinematographer sort of role. Um, well, no, actually, well, um, I was doing, I was producing, but I didn't take it as seriously as the filmmaking. And then the mu, and then I was doing, and then the music I was doing ended up taking off before the filmmaking did. It was weird. So, uh, you know, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's interesting. So, like, initially, did you start off doing, uh, like, the music side as kind of like a, like a passion thing, like a, a hobby? Is that, did you see it? I guess, uh, going the direction that it did. No. uh, Yeah, that was it. It was, I did music because I like to do music. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, you know, I've been making, I've been doing rap tracks since I was a kid. And, um, I, I cut my first demo, uh, when I was 16 or 17 and, um, and, and nothing ever happened with it. And so it was just kind of like, all right, that, you know, that's fun. And I'm, I'm going to do it regardless. I, we'd make tapes for, you know, I'd make tapes for my friends and we do cover art and stuff. We go to Kinko's and Xerox <laughs> and things like that. And, um, and we make tapes and pass the tapes around to each other. And that was it. It was just, it was just kind of, uh, because I like doing it. And, um, and I thought, okay, I'm going to go to film school. I'm going to become a filmmaker. I'm going to do this and do that. And, so I was just working odd jobs and I was trying to make, you know, I continued making short films and just trying to figure it out. And then I got in touch with Chuck online and he heard some of the remixes and he said, Hey, 
why don't you make an official remix? And so it was like 2002, I did my first official remix for Public Enemy. It was um, Got to Give the Peeps What They Need was the song. And I remixed it and they put it on a promo CD. And it ended up actually getting uh, picked up in a television show. They they licensed really? it for a TV really? show. So that was like my first paid music uh, situation. And, and from there, it just... I. I kind of became a produ- a music producer, so to speak. Wow, what show did that end up on? Um, it was a, it was one of those. Oh man, I can't remember what it was called. It was one of those, um, like uh, cop fire, you know, rescue shows. Um, okay. In the early, you know, in the early two thousands, it was like a like a like a Law and Order rip off kind sure. of thing. You know, I don't, I, I, I could, I have to look it up. I don't remember the name of it. it. It lasted a couple seasons, but it was, it was hilarious because the scene that they used the song in, um, the guy, there was a, there were two characters, and the one had a boombox and he was playing the song, huh. and the other guy wanted him to change the song and he said no, so the guy stabbed him. That was the whole set. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. So that was 2002. That happened, right? Yeah, I yeah, I did the remix in 2002 and the I I don't remember if the if it was um if the show came out then or it aired like the next year, but it was right around that time. Right. So how much of a of a freak out moment was that for you that Chuck D kind of scooped you up out of the I'm sure swarm of people he's got after him? Was that a pretty pretty big moment for you or was that kind of what you expected would happen? No, no, no. It was it was all surreal. Uh, I mean, I was a huge Public Enemy fan growing up. They were my favorite group, hands down, and I tried to follow everything they did. And um, and now, so then, you know, fast forward 10 years, 11, 12 years later, and he's calling me on the phone and, and hey, Doc, what's happening? It was just, it was all weird and, and really strange. Um, and now he's like, now he's a member of the family. You know, I, my kids call him Uncle Chuck. So it's, you know. Wow. It's, it's, it's 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 more commonplace now, but still every once in a while I'll be in a situation where, you know, if I'm at a gig and they're playing or whatever, and then he starts, you know, they start doing Fight the Power. I'm like, oh, my God, this is the guy that wrote Fight the Power, you know, and he's like a friend of mine. And so it still it gets a little surreal. But um, but yeah, at that time, though, it was it was all it was so exciting. It was it was such a trip because. I I never thought I'd have a shot like that. So, you know, it was it was cool. It was very cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. That's a crazy story from start to finish. But uh, we want to not only talk about Chuck D. We have you on the phone here. Let's uh, let's turn a little bit to your process. What did you? What was your kind of initial setup as far as producing goes? As far as kind of the more technical side of it. Dylan's our our sound engineer here. Oh, okay. So I started out making beats um, on whatever I could. Um, I, I I made pause tapes back in the day. You guys know what those are? I uh, uh, do not know. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So, so pause tapes are you have a dual cassette deck, and uh, and you've got a you have a song on one side that you're you know quote unquote sampling, and then you have a blank tape on the other, and you painstakingly play the break part that you want uh and then and you're recording on the other deck and you just record that section of the tape and then you pause it and then you wind rewind the the your song tape back to the beginning of the break and then you unpause it and then record it again and you loop it like that by hand and um it's actually very good for learning timing um and i want i want to um I, I actually credit uh, doing music as helping me as an editor, as a video editor, um, because I think it just imp- really greatly improved my timing and uh, and rhythm and things like that, because you deal with that in in cutting film and video and stuff. So uh, so I started out doing pause tapes and I, I, I was OK at it. I, I got all right at it. And then I, I would just wherever I could get keyboards from that had little samplers like there was a Casio uh, SK one, I think was the first sampling keyboard I had. Um, and it only had a a few minute, you know, seconds. It was like a, 
three seconds, I think, of sampling. But we'd make four track tapes out of that. And then uh, and then I got a rack mount sampler and, and we'd trigger that. And, and But we were doing everything on four track for years uh, until... I got until like 98, 99, and then I got um, I got my first like real PC that had any kind of decent processing power and a and a CD burner in it. And then I started doing music digitally, and it was really just a combination of different software at the time, like one of the early versions of Cakewalk um, and uh, Cool Edit. I used Cool Edit a lot. Um, I still do sometimes. So not to not to put an age on you or anything here, but you're talking 98, 99 is when you first started doing it on the computer. Is that high school? What what age were you then? Oh, oh, no, no, I, I'm I'm 40. I'm, I'm about to be 45 okay. in a couple of weeks here. So, yeah, I was so, yeah, I was into my, you know, uh, almost 30s, you know, their late 20s, okay. early 30s. So, um, yeah, so. um yeah, late twenties I would have been at that time when I started it, and then I got, and then I got a hold of Reason, and then uh, and Reason kind of changed everything, and I still use Reason to this day, so that's my uh, primary, primary, you know, um, works. That's such a a foreign concept for you know, straight out of college guys like us, not being surrounded by just the technology of it for so long. I mean. Dylan, what was your your recent experience like as a starting producer? What's your setup look like straight out of the gate? I mean, I'm sure you had way more resources at your disposal. Yeah, I just run Ableton right now, Ableton and Pro Tools. But I've I've seen Ableton and um I did a remix um with uh one of the other longtime PE producers, Gary G. Wiz, he and I did a remix on one of the Public Enemy albums from a few years back, and and, and we used Ableton. But he used it. I just kind of helped out. So that was my first experience with it. It's it's kind of similar in setup um, to Reason, so I wasn't totally foreign to it. But, yeah, it, it, it looked interesting. It's an interesting yeah, software. I love it. So coming from, you know, uh, you talked about having the, the two cassettes going, and you would kind of sample like that. Do you... Um, like I guess those earlier um, sampling methods, does, is that something that you see influencing how you make music now, or do you see that as like uh, like a technological gap that you kind of have to change up with, you know, using different softwares and stuff like that? No, I no, I think it all. I think it all. Um, mm-hmm. You build on it. You know, mm-hmm. you have that experience early on and like i said i think it made me it really helped with timing because back then your timing had to be extremely precise um but i'll tell you one thing that's interesting about it is that you also know where timing um where you can fudge it too you learn like um how you can be off a little bit and and give something a little bit of swag or a little bit of a slur to it you know and if you're going for a certain sound, a certain feel, I know that Chuck loves that. Um, when we were working on his most recent album, he would tell me, you know, it doesn't have to be, it always doesn't have to be exactly right on. And he likes it when things are a little loose. Um, I did a lot of the scratches on the record and I'm, I'm not a very, I'm not a precise DJ at all. In fact, I, I think I'm actually uh, kind of a half-ass DJ, but he, um, he likes that. He liked the, the sound. He goes, because it's loose, because it's not, it's not on time exactly. He said, um, you know, DJ Lord that he works with in Public Enemy and Prophets of Rage is a very precise DJ, you know, and, and he is. And Lord is a master at that stuff. He, his timing is impeccable, and he's always right on where he needs to be. But I'm not like that. And so it gives it a different feel and sometimes sloppy can be a good thing. So um, having coming out of tapes and analog equipment and stuff like that, I, I think gives me kind of a perspective that I can say, you know what, I can, I can take this. I don't have to quantize this beat. I can take this sample and slide it out just a little bit or take the snare and make it off just a little bit, just to give it a certain feel, give it a little funk to it. Is that something that you think is, how prevalent is that for other artists that you've worked with? Is that sort of common to want it sloppy like that? Or do most people want it clean and precise? It depends. 
I mean, it's it's. I like to look at tracks as you know, certain tracks require certain feelings, and um, I know some artists I work with. One of the one of my partners, uh, Marcus J. He's a he's a real in the pocket guy, so everything's got to be kind of right on. And if I start to get a, too weird with it, it just throws him all off. So, um, but that's just the way he works. It's not a good or bad thing. Um, and so it's nice to have the flexibility to be able to do that and 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 try things and and just see what feels right and what sounds right. Yeah, that's definitely an aspect of producing I've never really considered. But now I'm gonna now I'm gonna listen for that every time I I listen to a record from now on. If it, if you if you guys are if you guys are into rap and hip hop at all or beat making or things like that, um, you 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 know about J D J Dilla, you know, um, guy yeah. donuts and all that. Yeah. Of course, yeah. he was he was notorious for that. His his stuff is off just a little bit. Um, you know, he would he would let it. He he wouldn't quantize his beats all the time. Sometimes they're rigid, but sometimes he just let stuff slide a little bit. And I think actually he was one of the the guys that brought it back into fashion. Uh, I know that Questlove from the Roots says that he, for the longest time, he had to, um, he had to, he was trying to perfect being in time as much as he could. And then Dilla came along and he said, I had to relearn how to play because I had to throw it all out the window because, you know, because he would be work. Questlove would be working with D'Angelo and D'Angelo would want him to drag it. And he's like, oh, I'm not used to that anymore, you know, because I'm trying to be precise. I'm trying to be right on beat. So. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 interesting. It's it's an interesting thing to to have in your arsenal. And um, and sometimes you got to get used to it, you know, too, because. I, I know at one point in time, early on, I wanted everything to be quantized and everything had to be right on. Otherwise, it sounded weird to me. But now I've learned to kind of like, you know, let it breathe again sometimes if, if the track calls for it. Yeah, I often uh, I'll play to a metronome and I'll play mm -hmm. just little phrases like one bar at a time. And then loop that. Yeah, but right. like playing it will have that swing to it. And it, it'll exactly. be off. And and some I'll, sometimes I'll mess up and then go in there and drag it over a little bit. But yeah, like right, not right to the grid. Just keep it off a little bit so it has some swing to it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. That's exactly that's. And sometimes tracks need that. Sometimes it, it calls for it. Do you think that's? You said Chuck really likes his stuff just a little bit off. Is that coming out of his? You know famously booming powerful voice or is that a certain what sort of feeling does that evoke when it's off a little bit or is that kind of universal anything could be off a little bit if the artist wants it well that way? It, it's i think it depends i know he's taught he always references coming out of um doing stuff by doing stuff by hand literally like um you know they were remember when public enemy started first making records in the early days, they didn't have the equipment. And so they were using very, they got into using very primitive samplers, but at the time they were doing tape loops. Um, you know, uh, public enemy number one was a tape loop where they would actually cut the two inch tape and then stretch it out and run it around a mic stand and all this stuff. So it would loop. Um, but then they would play the drum machine by hand. So, um, you know, so it wasn't quite, on it wasn't quite right so it, it it's a little loose if you go back and listen to that record it's it's um you know it it's off a little bit and so i think he likes i think he likes the live musician kind of feel of it so hmm. that's interesting yeah it's de definitely something that i'm gonna keep a ear out for in the future it, are there more topics like that that spring to mind something that producers need to consider that I mean, the average Joe Schmo on the street wouldn't even think of being so time consuming or so prevalent in the creation process. Uh, you know what's you know what's I obsess over personally is mixing. Um, mixing drives me crazy sometimes, uh, just because um, I kind of I, I come from that old. I don't know. Uh, how do I want to put it? 
my my favorite kind of my favorite kind of mixing was the the kind of like the late eighties, early to mid nineties, where everything just kind of sat right where it was supposed to. And I know the the style has changed now because especially in hip hop and rap songs, they they put the they tend now to put the vocals up more and and, and the vocals are more up front and I like the vocals that just ride right along the top. I don't like them as loud as as they prefer. And sometimes, sometimes I'm told to turn the vocals up. But um, but yeah, mixing for me is is just rarely do I get it right on the first try. Every once in a while I do, but um, man, it, it is a it is a process for me. And and there have been certain songs that I've I've just hated it because I could never quite get the mix right. And um. And so that can make a break, a, make or break a song for me personally. Um, I don't know what, how, you know, your guys experience with it or how much attention you pay to it. Do or do you even mix your songs yourselves? Because I know other people have other people um, or bring in people to mix their their songs. I, I mix my own stuff. Yeah. Um, I intern at a studio and I can use some of the outboard gear there. Oh, nice. For that. And he's got a tape machine 16 track or 24 track Mm -hmm. but basically we just run digital sounds through that to kind of give it the i don't know like little warmth that tape gives sound yeah that that analog kind of yeah Mm -hmm. yep more more than like and we could record right to the tape but he usually just kind of just like reamps it through that and you mentioned that current hip-hop really likes the vocals up front and you like mixing kind of more even throughout for me mixing is something i only notice when it's done poorly i don't know if you listened to travis scott's last album but he had one verse on there that sounded like it was just in a, a completely different atmosphere it than the sounded rest of the like track. nav was recording from like outside of the studio yeah or like the <laughs> mic was way too high for him was it was it um was it like in the middle of the verse i did notice i did notice on i haven't heard travis's last album yet i did notice okay. on Pusha T's last uh, most recent album, which I really liked. Um, in the middle of one of the verses on "Comeback Baby," you can tell it's a different take because, like his his vocal tone changes like halfway through. So, um, so I did notice that, but um, I, I don't know if that's a, necessarily a mixing issue. But, um, but yeah, that's that's that's, that's that. interesting, huh? On uh, it was on Travis Scott's album. It was uh, famously uh, it was on um, Yosemite Nav's verse, the, like the last twenty seconds of the song. I think okay. it got clowned on so hard. He actually went back and like they remixed it because oh, it was wow. just getting memed on so hard. Wow, that's yeah. that's strange. I wonder why yeah. they would let that fly like that. Interesting. It almost sounded like it was a mess up. Like they didn't yeah. listen to it, and because it sounded like his vocals were just way, way too quiet. Oh, weird. Mm-hmm. But it's still out there; you can still hear it. Yeah, it's it's interesting that uh, that the things that slip through the cracks, you know that that always intrigues me when when um, things come out because then it's like, you know, I know famously, well, not famously, but I know just from experience that, um, I you know, I my quality control levels, I try to keep them pretty high so that, you know, things like that don't happen. So, you know, it go, it, I do the mix and I listen to it a thousand times and I sign off on it. It goes to mastering and then it comes back and I have to listen to it another thousand times just to make sure we got it right. So it's, it's, it's funny when stuff like that happens. Yeah. We have a, uh, kind of an ongoing debate here on the podcast about what is the, true album and i'd love to get your take on it because (laughs) nowadays we have the option of releasing an album somebody big name travis scott releases an album pulls it a week later re-uploads it with you know a different mix a different master whatever it is what do you consider and this is this will be the end of the debate for the rest of the podcast what's the true (laughs) album is it that first release or what he wanted it to be man that's a that is such a loaded question because I will I will I'll give you a film reference so which is the which is the true version of Star Wars you know is it the one that came out in 77 or is it the one that Lucas put out with new effects in 97 
you know, man, that's that's it's tough because you want to say from an artist perspective, it's whichever one the artist signs off on, you know. Um, but at the I same time, if that. they if they put it out into the world, um, you know, it, it, okay. For yeah. example, here's another example, and I didn't, I never realized this at the time. Uh, Chuck told me that when Fear of a Black Planet came out in 1990, um, it was the version that they put out wasn't the correct mastered version. It was two. It was a couple decibel. Uh, what was it? It was a decibel quiet. It was something like it was quieter than it was supposed to be. They 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 pressed up the wrong master of the album, what? and so uh, when they did the reissue a um, couple years back, um, obviously everything was remastered and bumped up louder. So you know, uh, which one is the which one's the correct one? Because he didn't, he never liked the original, but he likes the reissue because it's louder, like it's supposed to be. I have always been on the side of the debate that uh, whatever comes out on release date is the true album. But if Chuck D's saying the opposite, I I step down. Brendan, you win. <laughs> you take it. I mean, I mean, is it is it wrong to say that they're both right? You know. No, I think that's a obviously a middle ground is probably the right answer, but that's one of those one of those philosophical questions you can't help but wonder. Yeah, I mean, remember when Kanye did the Life of Pablo thing where he kept pulling yeah. it or, or, or re-releasing it or whatever, you know, right. every, every four or five days. And so, yeah, that's he he just did that with uh, what was it, Tayana Taylor's album? I think he pulled and re-uploaded yeah he does that all the time yeah so that's so i we've never been in a we've never really been in a situation as music fans where this has happened before you know i guess that i guess there have been times where there were errors or um i guess or, or another another thing would be um okay uh biz Markey's album um Oh, what was the album? I need a haircut. And he didn't clear a sample on it and he got sued. And so they had to withdraw the album and take that song off. And then they reissued it. So, you know, so what's the, what's the, what's the proper version of the album there? Um, or, or body count and cop killer. Cause uh, Warner's Warner's issued it with the song cop killer and then um, you know the everybody was up in arms about it, and then they yeah. withdrew the album and they re they re released it without the song. So, but different having different versions like this is kind of a whole new thing. Um, I I'm wondering if if artists just get too excited uh, about putting the album out and then they jump the gun sometimes, you know. And then it's so instant now with the internet that. Right. You could easily like click on the wrong file and like, oh crap. And then hundred people downloaded it right. in an hour <laughs> right. and it's all over the place. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, it's it, interesting times now. Interesting times that we're, that we're living in. Yeah. Technology really throws a, a wrench into everything. It does. It's, it's a, it's a blessing and a curse, man. Um, I've always said that because the, be the great thing about it is um, especially as artists is Technology has leveled the playing field. Um, and the worst thing about it is that it's leveled the playing field. So, um, you know, anybody can make a record in their bedroom, you know, or in their basement or in their kitchen or whatever. Um, I don't know if everybody should make a record, but maybe they should. I don't know. So you see that as kind of a, a negative thing. You think some, uh, I guess, a lot of rappers or producers coming up now, uh, I don't know. I don't want to put any names out there to whatever, but like, uh, do you think there are just too many, I mean, untalented people that are getting too much attention? Do you think that's a uh, kind of a sign of current music? Well, it's hard to say because, uh, because art is subjective sure. and I know that I used to be, in my late twenties, early thirties, I was pretty hard headed about stuff. And so I used to feel that way, but now I'm, I'm just kind of of the mind that 
if it has an audience, then it's worthy of something. It's worthy of someone's time. Um, I may not agree with it. I may not enjoy it. I'm, I'll skip it, whatever. Um, I try to give everything an even even shake, you know, these days because you never you never know where you're going to find something that you that you really dig. And that's kind of the exciting part about it. Um, mm-hmm. I do think that uh, I'll tell you this. I, I, I'll tell you where it goes bad is uh, when an artist feels they are entitled because they are an artist. That's when it usually goes bad. Um, because as an artist, that? you have to work and you got to put the work in, you got to put the time in and, and you just have to do that and, and get the experience. And that's going to make you a better artist. Um, but if, if in, I, I've known so many rap, <laughs> I'll, I'll say it right now, rappers, and especially I, I hate rappers, man. Rappers are, <laughs> <laughs> they can be the worst. Yeah. Um, they just, uh, I'm a rapper. So I'm in, you know, I'm entitled to this. No, dude, you are not, you know, have you done a show? Have you ever stepped on a stage and, and rhymed and, and, and got yeah. booed? You know, have you, have you been through that? You know, so or just or just have people be indifferent, turn around and walk to the bar, you know, or nobody shows up and you play the mm-hmm. show anyway. I mean, you know, it's it's their rites of passage and things like that. And I'm not saying everybody has to do that, but they have to. I, I think I think artists should humble themselves until they've earned something. They've earned the right to say something or they've earned the right to do that, to be like, you know what? I'm I'm pretty dope at what I do. I'm pretty good at what I do, and and so yeah, okay, I'll I'll take this. I'll take that. I'll take the accolades. Sure. I think there's just a lot more behind being a, a rapper and artist that than people realize. Oh yeah, and, definitely. Sure, sure. Yeah, and then they get like, I don't know, cool shoes, and then <laughs> they can like record a few lines, and then they're like, okay, I'm a rapper. But there's like so much, so much more to it than that. Yeah. And and, uh, you know what? What else cracks me up is that I've worked with guys that are like, okay, well, uh, Tupac would go into the booth and he'd record 30 songs. And Jay Z goes in the booth and he does one take, spit from memory. It's like, okay, but you got, you're not that guy. You aren't those guys. <laughs> you can't do that. And you have to do more than one take because your first take sounds like crap. So, <laughs> you know, so I, again, and I think, I think that's an entitlement thing. It's, it's, they're mm-hmm. like, well, I, you know, they do it. I can do it. I'll do it. And it's no, buddy, it's not how that works. Do it, you have any like, um, <laughs> other, I guess, uh, stories about uh i guess diva rappers like uh people that are real tough to work with could you get on here and say who the toughest person you've worked with is um i'm not you don't have to say it if you're not comfortable doing that no oh no no um i'm I'm trying to think of an i'm trying to think of an example yeah um uh i know i've worked with i know i worked with um on the video side, I know I worked with uh, somebody once that um, I was, I showed up and I was ready to go and it became like a three day long thing where we were hardly shooting anything. And it was just kind of like, it was a very bizarre situation where we shot a little bit and then we went to a different location and we were supposed to, to shoot some more. And then there was a, there was a, he had a family situation go on and the shoot all went to hell. And then it was just kind of like me and him sitting around and I was just kind of like talking him through life stuff. And it was, (laughs) it was strange. It was so, it was such a weird, weird shoot and definitely not what I expected. So, um, so yeah, that was, that was probably like the, the weirdest, weird, yeah. I mean, it seems like you got, you can like put life coach or something on your resume for the next thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I want to, cause I don't want to call me on that, but. Okay. So you kind of touched on a couple different topics there with new, kind of the new wave 
one of them is paying your dues, kind of getting out there doing this thing that you claim to be good at. And then the other one's more of kind of their attitude going into it. What's the, you said humble yourself, but what's the mark of a, of somebody that you can identify talent in when they're just starting out, not a lot of dues paid yet. What's the telltale sign of somebody that you think could be successful? If they show up and they're, um, I'll, I'll tell you what, if, 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 if one, I mean, obviously if they have the, the performance down or, or in the case of like, say an MC, so an MC comes in and they, and they have it down and they know what they're doing or they have a, they have a plan. They have some sort of idea, but, um, I've worked with guys that were, um, open to ideas and, and want to learn. You can, you can kind of tell because they want to learn stuff. And they're open. They're open to what you have to say, what input you have to give. But they may also say, "Okay, yeah, that's cool." But I was also kind of thinking this too. And and they're just they kind of want to just um take in the whole experience of it. And those are usually the guys that I'm like, you know what? You just you really want to do the work, and you want to make it work for you, and you want to make it happen, and you can see it. You can you can kind of feel it because they, they bring an energy, um, they bring an energy to the room and to the session and things like that. And it's like, okay, yeah, let's let's go. And and I know at least that they're gonna get something out of it that they're happy with, you know, mm -hmm. beyond anything else. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, because it's it's always it's always a weird thing, man. You never know you never know what's gonna happen. Uh, we I have a group um, that. Chuck, it was actually Chuck's idea and we're called the impossibles. And it started off because our first collaboration was we were MCs from different areas and we all sent, we would record our vocals wherever we were at. And then we MP3 them to each other. And then I, I was, I was producing the project. And so they would send, everybody would send their vocals to me and I'd make the song out of it. And so this, was like in 2000 when it was kind of unheard of to do now it's pretty commonplace but like we were one of the early early people to do it and so Ch when chuck got a, a distribution a new distribution deal for a slam jams label uh we were gonna be the first release on it and they the uh somehow the um uh the uh distribution company in the manufacturing process pressed up the completely wrong album and sent it out to stores oh geez yeah so i mean it was a nightmare so it was like our one our one big debut shot was just completely blown to bits and it was gonna it was gonna cost them too much to actually recall the album so it just had to sit out there and people bought the album and it was the wrong <laughs> it was totally the wrong album they're like how come it's supposed to have 20 songs and it only has 11 tracks on it? It's like, well, that's not the right CD at all. And So that's why you are a proponent of what the artist wants is the true album. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, well, definitely. Uh, yeah, because that was just a, a colossal mistake. So, yeah, I guess I guess br bring that story out. That that kind of seals it. But um, but yeah, man, so things like that happen. You know, you never it's just weird stuff like that happens. And 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 you never know you could have the most talented dude in the world but you know he's you know he comes in he he lays down a song and um and then he go you know um who's a who's there was a mc that q-tip was working with uh around the time of tribe second album around low end theory so it was like 91 and there was this kid that he was working with called kid hood and kid hood came in laid down a verse on the um, um, uh, scenario. It was the scenario remix. And he went home and like a day later he was shot dead. And Q-Tip was just like, he was going to be the next thing, man, this kid. And, you know, just weird stuff happens, you know, life things happen and get in the way. But, but back to your original question, if, if you can tell the people that are ready to work and ready to, to just put in the time, yeah, it sounds like there's a big difference between people being excited to rap and people being excited to get to the studio and work. Yes, that there is a difference. There's definitely a difference because 
Um, cause it's a process, man, you know, recording music, producing music is a process and you can, you go in with a plan It's filmmaking is the same way you go in with a plan, but you've got to be open to accidents because that can be the best stuff. And, and you have to have that wiggle room. Um, it's, it's great to try to get exactly what you want, but sometimes you got to leave yourself open to little things. You mentioned, uh, working with the impossibles and being a part of that. I think the the current sort of iteration of that process would be somebody like Brockhampton, mm-hmm. that whole group. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but I think they met on a, what was it, Brendan Kanye? It was fit? a Kanye West like fan uh, forum or something like that. Yeah. What are the uh, the challenges of working in kind of a, a virtual environment with so many people? I mean, are you guys all over the country, different countries what what's the setup there yeah the original the original uh iteration of the group was um we did have a we had an mc that was out of the uk um and so on the on the first recording we did and so yeah and we've and we've always been down to to collab with guys anywhere in the world there's a couple of mcs that uh we've worked with that are um, they're Canadian originally, but they live in Japan now they're brothers. And so we've collabed with them. And um, in the early days, the hardest part was the technology just wasn't quite there yet. Um, So you'd have to, you'd have to send everything in MP3 and because of bandwidth and sending files and things like that. And in fact, I, I remember the early, early days, um, people would even still send me, they record something and then burn it to a CD and mail it to me. So we'd collab like that. Um, but the, the technology just hadn't quite caught up, but now these days it's kind of the, the hardest part is if I hear something that I think they should change, then I got to be like, Hey, uh, can you, you know, send them an email? Hey, can you go back and re-record this part? And it's like, I'm not in the studio anymore. I don't, you know, yeah, it'll take me a couple of days to get it done. But, um, you know, so that can be, that could be the goofiest part. But, um, but, but since the technology is caught up, uh, I think, you know, it's, it's more commonplace now, you know, producers send beats to other guys and they're not even in the studios anymore. And it's, and that's, that's interesting. And I think it's good and bad. Um, of all the music I've done for Chuck, I was only in the studio with him once. So, uh, hmm. everything else, he just kind of records on his own and, and then sends it back to me. So, um, but that's just the, that's the kind of working relationship we have. Yeah. I think that's pretty commonplace now, as far as I'm aware anyway producers kind of just sending it to them and back and forth completely online. I'm sure that in one sense, that's a lot easier, but more just kind of annoying to kind of do the nitpicky parts of it. Um, yeah, I mean, luckily, luckily, um, okay. For example, like working with, working with Chuck, he'll send me a bunch of takes and then say, okay, here, pull from this. And then, um, and then on the last album, he was, he was like, uh, Hey, I'm going back into the studio. Do you want me to do anything extra? He, you know, he had heard some things in the temp mixes. He was like, you know what? I want to add something to this or, or just give me more to work with. Again, it's a different working environment. You know, it's a different way to work. Um, it's again, yeah, you're right. It's not a good or bad thing or it has good and bad things. I know that um, uh, when I work with, you know, uh, Marcus, like I mentioned before, he likes to get together to record. So he lives in Dayton, Ohio. I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He drives, he drives out four hours and we spend a weekend and we record a bunch of stuff. So, um, you know, he, now he can record something on the fly and send it to me. That's not unheard of. And then he'll say, Hey, I'm recording tonight. Can you be around to check the, you know, check the vocals? And I'll say, yeah, I'll, I'll check in. And then if he has to redo it, he will. So there, there are just different ways of working around the, the limitations. I think a lot of artists, they like to record alone. Well, it's, I think it's becoming more of a, in, increasingly more of an option because, you know, it, it might not have been before uh, because you'd have to have an engineer in the studio and so on and so forth. But now, if you know, my studio is in my office and I can just come in here and, okay, I got to bang out some vocals or I got to make a beat real quick. I can just do it. So, um, but then like, okay, somebody like Chuck, 
he has a setup where he can do it himself at home, but he prefers to go down the street to the studio in his town because then he can go in and he knows it's going to sound good. And, and then uh, his engineer can send it to me and there won't be any issues. So it, but it is definitely, I think, uh, an option that certain artists are, are becoming more fond of because they can. So we listen to uh, pretty much everything between the three of us that comes out here. What is, you mentioned Pusha T. What are you kind of staying on top of with hip hop? Do you listen to a lot of new releases or are you more focused on creating your own sound? No, I. you know what? The, the Pusha T album actually had a very... Um, Pusha T and Daytona and um, um, what's uh, Kendrick's uh, Damn album actually were big influences on Chuck's record, believe it or not, from me, uh, from oh. a production standpoint. Um, I, I, yeah, I try to listen to. I mean, I just try to listen to whatever, whatever's interesting. Um, Earl Sweatshirt's new album is really dope. Um, it, it's kind of just crazy. Um, and I, I appreciate the low fineness kind of grunginess of it. So, um, but I do, I still listen to a, a ton of old school records. Um, you know, cause that's just what I grew up on and, and I still love it to this day. Um, there's one of the songs on one of the songs on Chuck's album. Um, I remixed his, uh, uh, one of the singles it's called tired of 45, and um and it's it, the i didn't do the original and it's a very it's a more of a modern sounding song and i i heard it and it's cool um it's not my it, it's not my favorite stuff but it's cool it works and i thought you know what they're going to be pe fans that hear this and they're going to hate it and i thought you know what maybe i'll take a stab at remixing it and i'll do like a a throwback kind of version of it and i have been listening to LL's uh, radio album a lot at the time. And so I did a version that tried to sound like that. And, um, and, and Chuck, Chuck's like, yeah, look, put that first on the record. That'll be the first track on the record. I was like, really? I was like, it's just supposed wow. to be a remix. And he's like, no, no, I'll put, start the record off with that. Cause he just loved the throwback nature of it. I'm like, okay, cool. So, um, so yeah, I, I, you know, I take influence anywhere I can from from anything I, I like to listen to a lot of different things and i'm not opposed to listening to to uh the newest stuff i gave every every record that kanye put out this year i because I, i'm not a kanye fan at all um i like some of his stuff um but I, I i gave every album a shot i said um because you know why wouldn't i you know i get to give it a chance and and the Pusha album was my favorite of, of the ones he put out the the kid see kid see ghost was pretty good. Um, there's a couple joints on that I like. I thought his album was garbage. Um, Ye, you weren't a fan of Ye? No, not at all. Yeah, I thought it was terrible. So <laughs> interesting. Yeah, that 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 was going to be my next question. What's the the top and the bottom <laughs> of your uh, your Kanye albums? Of yeah, the year? yeah, that one that one was really disappointing. The Nas one, I got to go back and listen to again because. I listened to it and it was kind of there, but nothing really stood out to me. Mm-hmm. So I kind of, yeah. I got to go back and I listened to the Nas album. And like, you know what? I'm going to put Push's album back on. Cause I'd rather listen to that right now. <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of people had the same thought. Yeah. It was just kind of like, and it was, it was a shame too, because I, I don't, um, I like Nas. I don't worship at the altar of Illmatic like some people do. I do think it's his best album. Um, and um, But I don't think it's the greatest rap album of all time. But that's me. You know, that's my you know personal opinion. Um, but I think he works best when he's brief like that. And Illmatic is a 10-track is a album with an intro. So it's actually nine songs. And so I was like, okay, he's getting Kanye. They're doing seven tracks. The the album cover's dope. This could really be something. And then it was just kind of there. And I was like, okay, you know, maybe I'm missing something. So again, I got to go back and listen to it. 
and and give it another shot. But you know, I thought Push's album was really dope, and I'm glad they put that one out first because that was uh, definitely the strongest one to to lead with. Yeah, yeah, I think that was pretty pretty well liked between the three of us. I can't remember exactly. Yeah. Um, Nas had a line on that album, something something to the a statement of Nas is nothing without a producer behind him. Nas really credits the production for getting him where he is today. Do you, how do you see that as a producer? Do you see yourself as having the power to take an okay rapper and make them great? Or kind of what is, what is your role in boosting someone? Could you take a mediocre rapper and make them great? Or does that, rapper need to stand on their own even before you come in uh it's easier if they can stand on their own i don't i don't think i can make a mediocre rapper great i might be able to give them a great song um as a producer your role is to make them make the song sound as the the best possible way it can so um so if if I get somebody and I can recognize their strengths and their weaknesses and have them play to their strengths and then craft a song around that, we could probably make a great song. You might be able to make a couple great songs. Um, if you're lucky, if you're in the pocket, you might be able to make a great album out of it. Um, but I don't think you can solely elevate, um, you know, someone's entire career from that. Um, maybe you can. It'd be really tough. But um, I I think Nas I would agree with I re- would agree with his statement just because of some of the albums he's put out over the years, and I know that um, I know that there was a there was a great oh man there was a great article somewhere and I can't remember it might have been actually might have actually been Questlove that wrote it, um, but I don't know if that's correct. But anyway, a few years back, and it was saying how Nas changed after it was the source awards or something like that. When, when Biggie got all the acclaim, when ready to die kind of won the awards and, and Illmatic didn't. And you could see, he said, you could see in Nas's face, there was a fundamental shift in the, in his thinking. And then he's like, you know what? I got to do uh poppier songs, I guess. And, um, and, and, and not be so worried about the, the ruggedness of the streets. I mean, his first album, Illmatic is a, you know, he had the cream of the hip hop produ- production crop there, man, you know? So, you know, premier large professor, LES, Pete rock, Q-tip. I mean, you know, he, he went for the, the hip hop fans go to guys to produce that record. And then after that, it was like track masters and okay, these guys are making, trying to make hit records. So there was that fundamental shift. So, and for Nas, it didn't always work. Um, you know, he, w- he would try to do those records and they didn't always fly. Um, so I could see why he would say that. Um, I think he's still searching, <laughs> you know. Um, I don't think he's quite figured it out yet, but music is funny like that, man. It really is. Yeah, we see a lot of artists that they get such huge acclaim, such a status. How do you follow that up? I mean... Chuck D in particular, huge status, public enemy, household name. How do you follow that up afterwards? And it's it's great to talk to somebody like you who's kind of in that process with him, still bringing out his strengths and, yeah, being involved in that process. You know what? The, the thing early on working with Chuck that I had to get over, I had to get past, was uh, because the temptation was there. The temptation was always there to... Let's make another it takes a nation of millions to hold us back. You can't. You can't make another it takes a nation. Chuck is older now. It's 30 years later. He's not going to sound like that. He doesn't sound like that. He's not trying to sound like that. And the best piece of advice he gave me was don't try to make every, um, one record sound the same to the next. And, you know, do what you do best and, and, and you get your lane and you get the things that work and you figure out what doesn't work. But you also got to try to kind of stretch it. Um, when we were working on the last Public Enemy album um, f- from 2017, it's called Nothing is Quick in the Desert. Um, 
he said, everybody's starting to speed up beats again. Let's go slower. Let's go the opposite. Let's, let's slow everything down. And, uh, so that's what we tried to do. And, and so he's, I, I like the fact that he wants to take chances and try some things and always try to mix it up a bit. So that's, that's encouraging for me. Yeah. And he, he put that album out just on like YouTube. He didn't even try to promote it or sell it really. Did he? Uh, that's complicated. It, it, <laughs> it was dropped as a, it came out as a, as, as a band camp release for a week and it, a free release for the fans. And then, um, and then we, and then we pulled it and we had every intention of releasing it in a traditional fat, uh, traditional manner. You know, we were getting ready to do vinyl CDs and, and we were even going to do cassettes. And um, and then we were uh, there was a there was a lawsuit. And so that stopped everything. And so everything kind of came crashing to a halt. So um, and and it's not it's not it wasn't Chuck's fault. Um, it was a, a bad previous business situation but the album got swept up into it. And so uh, we're just waiting now to get every, hopefully get everything resolved. And then we're going to put the album out. So that's the idea. Um, he's even talking about reworking some of the, <laughs> there you go. He's even talking about reworking some of the tracks. So, <laughs> which is the official version, you know? Right. Well, we don't want to take up too much more of your time here. We try to shoot for about an hour, but you did mention earlier what uh, what you don't consider the best hip hop album of all time. Can we get your opinion dealing with superlatives here? <laughs> best hip hop album of all time? I can't. T- I can't. I n- I never try to say what the best is, but I'll tell you what my favorite is. Okay. Um, all right. All right. Because again, it's subjective, and I've tried to get away from saying that stuff. But my favorite album, probably still to this day, is. Public Enemy's Fear of a Black Planet. And the reason why is it's so dense and so complicated that even now, almost 30 years later, anytime I listen to it, I hear something different. I hear something that I didn't hear before. Um, whether it's a, I pick up on a line or, a, or or something or a sound in the background of the mix, it, it truly is an amazing album And, you know, and the conversations that I've had, I've been fortunate enough to have with Chuck about that album and how they put it together. It's just jaw dropping the amount of work that went into creating that album. And, um, and it's, and it still holds up to this day to me, for me anyway. So it's my, it's still my favorite. All right. There you have it. Listeners at home, best album of all time. He won't say it, but we will. (laughs) Now, can you guys... You know, do you guys, I, I'm curious about your opinion, you know, favorites. Oh, I'm a, I'm a big Eminem guy. Brendan hates me for it, but I got to <laughs> say Marshall Mathers LP. That's probably I'm my favorite. I'll say favorite too, best okay. somewhere in there. I know a lot of people that love that record. I think it's too long, but that's just me, you know? Yeah. Too much D12 on there. If he could, could have kicked D12 <laughs> off a little bit, would have been I just, better. I remember listening to it for the first time I was in the car. Uh, um, driving somewhere and I was like, wow, why isn't this album over yet? And <laughs> kept going and going and going. I mean, it was a long, but then it, I, I also got to say back at the time when that album came out, that was kind of the, that was the MO for, for putting out albums on major labels. It was like pack it full of songs, man, fill up the entire 78 minutes of the CD or whatever the hell, you know? So that was just kind of the thing back then. You get a little bit more of that. You're having albums that are like Sway Lee or what was it? Ray Schremer, they dropped it like a three, a triple album. And you had like Migos dropping like 20 some tracks and Drake yeah. doing the same. You'll either have one of those extremes or you'll have, you know, the Pusha T seven track albums. You get a, you know, it seems like it's one or the other. You know what, you know what really, and just to follow that up with is what, what bothers the hell out of me about that is that, um, people don't know what the terms mean anymore. Um, you can have a seven track album. I remember when, when Push's album dropped, people were like, this is like an EP. I'm like, no, an EP is four songs that you put on a 45. That's what an EP is. You know, that's what it is. It's, it's, it's not a single, it's not an album. 
but it's like if it's seven songs and he calls it an album, it's an album, man. That's what it is. So, um, you know, and then other guys are like dropping. Yeah, this is my new EP and it's 10 songs. I'm like, no, what the hell are you talking about? That's an album. You know, <laughs> um, Isaac Hayes is Hot Buttered Soul is four songs. Now, granted, you know, they're 10 minute songs, but still it's it's four songs and it's an album. So, you know, people just I, I don't know the the terminology and the definitions have gotten out of hand of what's to what is what like it, and it drives me nuts you know it's not real hip hop yeah what what are you talking about you know it's like look it's a, it, it's either a rap record or it's not or it's a pop record or they're like oh, i hate drake cuz he's not doing real hip hop drake's a pop artist let him be a pop artist you know you don't have to listen to him if you don't want to if you don't want to hear it so but um, but yeah, you know, they still have that. They're putting out thirty songs or whatever, triple albums, and shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy, but it is. You know, artist uh, prerogative, right? What's your uh, favorite record, though, Brendan? He said why I was wrong. Oh, <laughs> it's not well, why you're wrong, I'm, man. I'm just... is the best <laughs> album of all time. Hip hop, hip hop, hip hop, best hip hop album. Um, oof. Uh, Aquemini? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, that's a good show. Dylan, what do you what's your favorite? There? What's your favorite album of all, all time? Then that'd be Blonde, Frank Ocean. Oh wow, wow, interesting, <laughs> interesting. Definitely, it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think about the other one? Uh, the, uh, what was the what was the one he dropped the day before? Oh, that was like to get out of his deal with Def Jam, Endless. I yeah. like that. It was good, right? It was good. It wasn't as um, I don't know. It wasn't trying to be as grandiose. It wasn't trying to be as big, but it's got a it's got some real good songs on it. That's what I thought too, and I thought it got overshadowed by Blonde, and I was like, wow, that's a shame because there's some really good stuff on this record. I think that's yeah. another thing people didn't know how to interpret that because when that came out, it was a uh, you know, air quotes, visual album. And it was right. only released through Apple Music. So I, nobody was like, w- they're like, what is it? And then like Blonde came out and they're like. Oh yeah, here's the album. The, right. Yeah, Wayside. Yeah. I, I I know he released like limited edition versions of of uh, all that stuff. I wish he'd <laughs> re-release it because I'd like to actually pick those up. Yeah. but yeah. And not have to pay $300 for them. Yeah, I, pay, I spent money out the ass to get uh endless i've got a record player i bought the record and i spent like man that had to be like a hundred dollars on like a double album yeah it's really endless cool. that's right. that's what it was called yeah wow Dang. well i salute i salute you for your uh for doing that sir. for my economic that's... irresponsibility <laughs> hey man when it's music sometimes you got to do that yeah dylan what do you got favorite hip-hop record of all time uh, mine ch- changes daily. Sure, but right now I would have to say ASAP Rocky is testing. Uh, I haven't heard Bobby. that. I yeah, heard I like that. that a lot. It's so good. Wow, that is a surprise to us, and we're friends over here. Huh? <laughs> it came out of nowhere. Yeah, I just decided that right now. That's my favorite. Song. <laughs> I thought you were going. I definitely thought you were going Wiz Khalifa, Kush, and OJ. That's a good one too. I mean, that's, but yeah, it's old. You gotta keep it's up. Mixed tape. <laughs> and it's mixtape. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Now, now, can I can I ask real quick what you guys think about the mixtape like you know moniker? Because I think really mixtape just started so people could sample whatever the hell they want and not get sued for it. Yeah, is the distinction is the distinction between like an an album in a mixtape is mixtapes are like released for free to specifically get around the, like the sampling stuff. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's yeah. what, I mean, a mixtape back in the day used to be, it was a collection of songs that were already out. Sure. So, sure. you know, that we put out on that we would make tapes, you oh, know, actual oh. tapes. Chuck had a, Chuck had a great line on one of the songs. that's something about a mixtape, but it, but it's not mixed and it's not tape or something like that. Mm-hmm. I forget. <laughs> I forget what that was, but it's but it, you know, but uh, yeah, I still I I know they're mixed tapes. I have a Wiz mixtape, um, that he put out when he was still here in Pittsburgh. Welcome to Pistolvania, I think it is. Deep you know, cut. I think that's a deep cut from Wiz. <laughs> that's, that's yeah, cool. I mean, it's like 
you know, burn burned and printed on a printer and stuff, you know, that kind of thing. So nice. huh. early, early, early Rostrum records days or whatever it was. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, Pittsburgh's own. Pittsburgh got to represent. Yeah. All right. Yes. Anything oh. else you want to shout out, promote? Uh... Um, Just the, the main thing right now is Chuck's album. And we're going to, we're going to get the, uh, you can get it on CD. Now we got vinyl and cassettes coming. For any of the tape heads so um yeah that's the main thing i just want to trying to get the word out i know um we don't we don't have a big advertising budget behind it so a lot of people didn't even know it was out so it's just kind of like spreading the word word of mouth to let people know chuck d's got a new album it's called celebration of ignorance and it's on Bandcamp and all the digital outlets and and uh and it's out there and um you know hope hope people dig it it's been, you know, the fans have been giving it some pretty positive reviews. So, yeah, yeah, we'll definitely link it in the description, all that fun stuff. But definitely Great. check it out. Fantastic, thanks, guys. Right. I appreciate. it. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, talking to us here. We really appreciate it. I'm sure we'll be talking about this conversation off mic here for a while. So it's, <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Take thanks. care. You too. Take care. See you.